Hey, everybody. Welcome back to a new installment of Collider Connected. I am Collider's managing editor, Adam Chitwood, and today I am thrilled to be joined by production designer, Nathan Crowley. Nathan, how are you? Uh, uh, very good. Um, we're just sitting in Brooklyn, uh, uh, biding our time, and yeah, everything is good. Great. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We've got a lot to talk about. Your resume is mighty impressive. So. Thanks. Um, I was wondering if, if kind of to start out, if you could maybe um, just kind of explain, maybe for some people who are film fans and don't know exactly, just kind of briefly, like what, what your role is as a production designer on a set, kind of what, um, what's under your purview, I guess. Well, yeah, it's, it's a, you know, production design, um, you know, took over from the term art direction because really we have to encompass uh, the sort of whole look of the film and that, that journey, that visual journey uh, from script, the written word, uh, to building the world or creating the world or choosing the world or defining it, that that film exists in. So we have to sort of define visually the place and the setting for the whole film. Um, I always, you know, and with that comes sort of, there's many, many branches of the art department. We are the art department. So we have construction, we have set dressing, we have props. Uh, we oversee locations because we have to define uh, to make sure, we have to define the location to make sure it fits in with our sort of look or themes of the film once we've discovered what that is. So, our, our, you know, we go all the way through to obviously talking to the DP and the costume designer uh, and the sort of managerial side of it, which is, you know, budgets and, and, and labor. We have a vast amount of people under our, you know, under our wing, you know, construction can, you know, which is the backbone of all film, you know, can, can be a mighty number of people. Um, and so really, yeah, I work primarily with the director to define the visual look of the film very early on. And that's where my job starts. Uh, and then often, we often say, we have to then, as production designers, we have to design the production, which means we have to try and get everyone uh, on board to you know, shoot in certain places that affect the look dramatically or are key to a scene. So it's really hard to, one of the problems we have as designers is it's really hard to describe specifically what we do. Um, <laughs> because it changes through, you know, through pre-pre-production to pre-production to production. And then now, you know, a lot of us are getting involved in post-production if you work on the digital side. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that explains it. <laughs> no, it, it illuminates it. I mean, I'm kind of curious, when did you, I mean, were you always interested in, in design and film? And I'm curious when you kind of realized that those two passions could be combined into this job. No, I totally, uh, it, I totally fell into it. Um, I grew up in, uh, in North London um, and, uh, you know, film really wasn't on my radar uh, in terms of a, a job I could get. I mean, there are obviously there was Shepparton and there's Pinewood, but it weren't really on my radar. It just seemed an impossible place to go. And I wasn't really, I didn't really understand that there, there was this job in there. Uh, so I sort of went to art school. I did a year in London. Um, fine art and then I went down to the south coast to Brighton Art School and uh, studied uh, a course which is now called interior architecture but when I did it, it was called three-dimensional design <laughs> so um, and uh, out, out of school I knew I, I loved design my father was an architect so I had a passion for architecture because it was we grew up in a sort of glass house um, and so it was uh, my mother was a painter so it was like you know, I, I, but I knew I didn't want to be an architect. So uh, I was a little, I guess I was a little lost. Um, uh, you know, I did some, I actually worked for architects drafting for a couple of years in London. And then uh, I had some friends in Los Angeles. So I literally went on an adventure in my early 20s and haphazardly got a job in <laughs> at TriStar Columbia in, in the drafting rooms. I, I could always draft. So, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a complete mistake. I mean, it was a mistake. I, I sort of discovered through a friend that there was this art department. And I, I felt like, um, 
you know, I really, really wanted to be part of it. So then I focused in trying to get a job as a draftsman. And I think once I got that first job, I realized this is completely my place. I still remember walking down what is now Sony and all this water flooding out of the stage. And I looked through the doors and there was a, a ship the size of HMS Victory being built in a water tank. And it just seemed so like wondrous. And I, I really, I, I thought, oh my, and then people rushing around with scenery and painters and it was, um, it, it, I remember thinking, wow, this is, I want to be here. So. <laughs> well, one of your first jobs uh, was on Steven Spielberg's Hook as a junior set designer, which the sets in that movie are just massive. What do you remember from, from working on that one? Well, the story I just told you was actually Hook. So Hook? Okay. I've been bugging, uh, once, I, once I found out what my good friend who was working in the art department, who weirdly was at Brighton Art College, a few years ahead of me and uh, he, he said well why don't you come and meet the production designer Norman Garwood and the two art directors uh, Tom Sanders and Andrew Precht um, and uh, you know we got on really well and they kind of took a chance on me and said well sure you can start you know drawing on um, draw I think I was drawing on Tinkerbell's oversized furniture but, uh, but uh, you know, I think that that being my first job, um, in a weird way, is a little deceiving because I, <laughs> I assumed that all films were like Hook. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and so, so it was, I mean, it was brilliant to start at such a fantastical place, um, you know, and, um, but yeah, those people really helped me. You have one of the kind of more fruitful collabor like director production designer collaborations with Christopher Nolan. And I believe your first time working together was on Insomnia. Um, I was curious what, uh, what that experience was like and kind of what, what your impressions were of uh, Chris. Cause I mean, he was coming off Memento, which just kind of like rocked the industry as this really original, um, fantastic film. And now he's making a studio movie with a studio budget with uh, big movie stars. Yeah, um, it, it was a weird, I still, again, I remember these sort of moments specifically. I remember I was finishing out Behind Enemy Lines and I was coming back in flight gear on the on aircraft carrier, US aircraft carrier into San Diego. And I happened to be sitting on the bow after five days out at sea, exhausted. And um, I, the phone went, and we'd been out of self-service for, forever. And... Uh, it was my agent. He said, oh, you, you, you've got to meet this Englishman, Chris Nolan, who wants to see you immediately. Can you get in a car and come up? I mean, I was absolutely exhausted because we didn't sleep on that carrier. And uh, so I went up uh, into LA and knocked on his apartment door and I um, and sort of walked in and uh, we just hit it off immediately. Um, turns out he grew up two doors down from my best friend. So... <laughs> You know, we were like talking about North London. It was like, well, which street do you grow up on? And it was like, it was like, hold on, you grew up on Bishop's, uh, right? It's like, what? And um, he was five years younger than myself and my friends. So, you know, he was just the kid on the block. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, we just hit it off. And then he was in a, you know, it was insomnia. They were in a hurry. They needed to get up to Vancouver. We were pretty much... Um, uh, we were sort of instructed, uh, you know, to take the Vancouver tax deal and we needed to go and shoot there. And the film was supposed to be about a small town in Alaska. So that, you know, that didn't quite fit into this sort of circle of Vancouver. So we knew we had to somehow push the boundaries of locations and go north into BC, which eventually happened. Uh, and I think together... You know, I, I think we had this immediate sort of friendship. So we together we sort of found that film together. Uh, we just scouted and scouted and scouted together. And I love the fact that he is one of those directors that, and until to this day now, we just we it's like let's just get going. Let's get on a plane. Let's go and let's go and find the film. We just go. I call it we go wandering, and we used to just go wandering in one city. Now we go wandering around the world, and we just talk and. Um, you know, we just talk and uh, he usually, you know, he, he always has the script in place. He's not going to, 
or pretty much usually the third act sometimes is a bit needs some work but he um he usually invites me in and and, and then we just go off on, on these sort of travels and you know a lot of it i think is him investigating the visual look of the film and you know what's wonderful about it is he's spend we can go up for you know usually it used to be long it used to be 10 days now it's about a week and we um i get to hear i get to hear the film he puts the film in my head uh and i think as a designer and i'm sure any other hod's you have to be you have to be playing a version of the film uh to, to design it and hopefully you're playing the same version that the director's playing <laughs> so um so yeah I, that's where it started and um, I he'd spent so much money on uh, trying to promote Memento. I, I remember vividly he had holes in his shoes, <laughs> so, <laughs> and we were going uh, up to the wettest place in the world <laughs> for one of them. Goodness. Um, well, then obviously you guys go and make this tiny movie called Batman Begins, um, which I mean, it, it, I think people somewhat forget how radical that movie was in terms of reinventing the comic book genre and how you could approach um, comic books. Cause it was such a grounded, realistic, gritty approach to this kind of thing, you know, not without humor, but um, it was kind of leaving behind the aesthetic of the Tim Burton and Joel Schubacher films. Um, what were those conver those early conversations you were having with Chris? Cause it, again, y we take for granted now that like, Oh, you know, the Gotham city of Batman begins, but it didn't exist until you guys got together and came up with it. I remember when Chris, Chris had, you know, I went around to, to his house for lunch. Um, and, uh, Chris, uh, you know, started talking about like he wanted to remake Batman and, uh, you know, at the time it was like, Wow, you know, you know, hasn't everything been done? Um, and and then he sort of slowly started explaining to me what he wanted to do. And um, I remember after that lunch, he sort of he was just sort of he 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 got me very excited. And he was saying, well, you know, one of the biggest things he wanted to try and do was you know redesign the Batmobile. And uh, I remember he, he he you know he specifically talked to me, so I went away. It was a Friday. I went away um, uh, and I went down to Toys R Us <laughs> and bought a bunch of, <laughs> of uh, vehicles and went over to my workshop and cut everything up and smashed them up. And I thought, well, he, you know, we talked about mixing a Lamborghini with a Humvee. And, I, you know, so that's exactly why I thought, well, let's just start somewhere. And so we smashed this thing together. Uh, or I did, and I left it on his doorstep on Monday morning. And then uh, he called me, and then we, he said, of course, we've got to get in here. Let's, um, let's convert my two-car garage into a workshop art department and figure out how we're going to do this film. And, you know, his thing was like, I've got to explain everything. I've got to explain why Batman is Batman and why all these things, these things don't magically work. He doesn't have any superpowers. He just, he's, he's physical and he has technology and he has his, his money. His money is his superpower. So we really just started from, from that moment. And Jonah was there, Chris's brother, uh, you know, helping as well. And uh, so we just decided to take the Batmobile to just as something to start with that might inform the rest of the film. So that's really where, when we often you read about Oh, The Garage, and that's kind of where that art room started, was like, we just got to get going and somehow we got to work it out. We had sort of, we had a bit of time, more time than we have on most films now. We had like three months to try and figure out what the film was. And I think, you know, again, Chris wanted some visual help. You know, he had these ideas, he had this uh, script. He was a very visual person. Uh, and he loves making models and stuff. I think he can draw and stuff. So it's, we work together in that art, in that garage. So I think it was really about trying to define every single element and then trying to figure out how this thing linked together. I think it holds up tremendously well and it, it's really striking. And, you know, at the time it, it felt um, kind of momentous. And I don't think we expected that you guys would one up it so significantly with The Dark Knight. Um, which at once feels, you know, a, a part of a whole. It, it feels in in step with Batman Begins, but um, 
you know, that, that film is very much inspired by heat and it feels like Gotham city is very much a character in that film. What was, what was kind of your guys' approach going into that one? Cause I, I mean, most people now hold that up as one of the best comic movies ever made. I think for me, I don't think it's true for Chris. Dark Knight is actually the Batman I always wanted to make, but we had to step over Batman Begins to get to it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, desperate modernist. I like simplicity. You know, Gotham, you know, on Batman Begins, you know, I struggled with trying to, you know, to make sure we didn't uh, destroy the comic book mess, I guess if that's a word, of of what Batman was. And we tried to explain everything in the cave and that was under Wayne Manor and how that worked, how you got down to it, you know. So there was a sort of lots of explanation in the design. And I feel, and I'm very grateful for Chris because he burnt everything down, Batman Begins. Yeah. <laughs> Wayne Manor didn't exist. <laughs> Therefore, the Batcave didn't exist. So it allowed me, and on Batman Begins, we, we pushed and pushed and pushed to shoot uh, some of it in Chicago. Chris had grown up part, partly in Chicago. His mum's from Chicago. So we had this sort of lower whacker drive. We, we had a taste of Chicago, and Chicago obviously is where modern architect, architecture, it's just sort of, it, it's, it's, it's not his birthplace, but it's where it continued, you know, where, you know, Bauhaus went, where all the great architects who couldn't build in New York went to Chicago. So he's got this amazing architecture. So we knew, we knew what we were going to do uh, if we got the chance to make a second film. And then the fact that uh, Chris and Jonah wrote to burn everything <laughs> and David Coy, <laughs> obviously, um, was uh, uh, fantastic for me because then, then I could say, okay, he lives downtown. You know, we're, we're dealing with Harvey Dent. We're dealing with government. We, government is like federal buildings. You know, it, it can be this sort of vision uh, of, of, you know, it has a hangover from the 60s for me. Um, and then... So that's where it led. And then the Bat Bunker obviously uh, was one of my favorite things to do. And actually one of the simplest sets I've ever built. So, uh, oh, yeah. 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 Uh, I, I mean, one of the, I was there opening night and there were a few moments where the crowd, you know, was electric. But one of the biggest cheers I've ever heard in a theater is when the Batmobile explodes and the bike shoots out. Um, was that was that on you to figure out how that all fit <laughs> inside the Batmobile and could come out? That was actually a Warner Brothers um, executive uh, in, uh, in early garage times uh, saying, um, uh, hey, you know, the bike could come out of the car. And we sort of, there might have even been on, um, uh, on Batman Begins. I remember we kind of just like, Meh. You know, and it sort of came back to us. And I think, um, you know, it was, it was like, oh, yeah, you know, I think they're right. We have to pull the bike out of the car. And, um, you know, so then it became this sort of secrecy of, like, we couldn't say there was, you know, a bike in it. And we, you know, we, he has to sacrifice the Batmobile, um, you know, and we have to, the Phoenix has to arrive in the form of the bike. And so I remember we were very much in secret building that thing. Uh, and there was no point modeling it because right? we like to use models and you know, play with things because it was like, it was like, oh, we might as well just go to Home Depot and buy some parts and build it full size model. And then so we sort of snuck up to Warner Brothers and nicked the tires off the Batmobile and brought them back to the garage. But we couldn't tell anyone why we were doing it. And these were in the days when I could go to Home Depot with Chris and no one would recognize him. Chris, you go and find the, you go and find some plastic pipe. <laughs> I'll go and do this. So we sort of divvied it up, and then we go to the plastic store. And that, that those days have gone. I can't take him anywhere. <laughs> Nothing done. But um, but yeah. So I mean, that moment of of him destroying the Batmobile or, or the Joker. I mean, the, you know, the game is on. I, I I I agree with him. In fact, my favorite moment is is when it the the bike is going up, up a whacker at high yeah. speed and there's this sort of momentous speech at the end of the film. So, yeah. Uh, that film is, uh, is brilliant. And obviously Heath Ledger's performance is just 
absolutely iconic and and tremendous. Um, and I know Chris had said he, he, you know, he tackled each film at a time, but was there, uh, I know there have been rumors that there was talk of bringing the Joker back for a third Batman if Chris was going to make it. Was that, were you no, privy to any conversation about that? Nothing that, I mean, I'm there from very early on. There, there was nothing on Batman Begins. Yeah. There's none of that conversation. Um, you know, the, he, he, you know, I think they need to stand as individual films. I mean, visually they are, all three are very different, you know. Yeah. They are, I mean, if you look at them, the difference between Batman Begins and The Dark Knight is like, you know, is, is immense. And then, then we went back to this sort of Raja Ghoul area, you know, where, and then I, I think once we discovered, because we shot most of Dark Knight in Chicago, then we, you know, did the interior sets in, uh, in London in an old airship hangar, in, which we ended up keeping for 10 years or something. And then Dark Knight, we, you know, in between, what we've done is we did, we've done these films in between the Batman films, like the prestige got slotted in there. And we sort of, you know, that was very low budget. So we, we sort of slowly discovered the beauty and advantage to getting around locations and getting as many as possible. So by the time we get to uh, the Dark Knight Rises, we are going to like three different countries, you know, so, and I think, um, you know, and that really expands the scope of the film uh, practically. Obviously, we we make films practically. We um, we avoid set extensions and as much digital work as possible. Uh, obviously, it's in there because it has to be in there. But we try and not. We don't give over to it until we can't. We only do it when we have to. So, and that the question of when you have to is different for all people. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> and for well, us. It's like, it really, really has to be an impossibility. So. Yeah. Well, and you say, I mean, The Dark Knight, you finally got to really showcase Chicago. Um, but coming to The Dark Knight Rises, it feels different and just absolutely epic. Um, what was that challenge like for you to come in for a third one and now make it feel visually distinct from those other two films? Well, we'd always... You know, Batman Begins, uh, myself and Chris, you know, uh, I mean, I live in, in Brooklyn, so we always, he'd come over here, he'd just often come and write in New York. Uh, I won't tell you where. Uh, and um, I get a phone call, and so we, again, we go walking. We walk the city and uh, talk about what if Gotham was here, you know, like, you know, what if the film wall was here? So we always talked about New York, but never, never, um, never shot in New York because Chicago, it's, it's hard to shoot here and on, to close down the kind of areas we would need to close down. It, it's very difficult. So we always talked about, you know, we play the film here and then we go to Chicago, which we both know. And then I think um, by the time we got to Dark Knight Rises, it was like, kind of have to film in New York. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we kind of have to go, if we're going to do it, we have to actually finally play Gotham as New York. Because um, uh, on Batman Begins, we, begins, we walk around downtown uh, and, and say, okay, imagine if Gotham was here. Like, let's talk about how it could be here. And really that informed the prestige because we shot the whole of prestige downtown, uh, even though it's Victorian London. So, you know, so one, often these things, these ideas sort of flow and weave and we sort of, you come back to stuff that maybe isn't right for one thing, but you remember it or, you know, the, the age old thing is we scout the next film and we find all the locations for the last film. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But Iceland has always played a big part in our films. You mentioned the prestige. That's one of my favorites. Um, and it feels, uh, you know, I think what you said is correct. I like that Chris kind of changes, changed things up. He didn't just do three Batman movies in a row. He really did very different movies in between those films and the prestige, uh, you know, coming off of Batman begins, you know, you're going period. It's a bit of a smaller scale, but you're also, you know, creating practical magic tricks. What was that uh, challenge like for you? Uh, that's actually weirdly, it's one of my favorite films. We, yeah. it was, um, it was, I, I so enjoyed it. I enjoyed all the trickery and I enjoyed the story and I, I love the fact that the trick is so simple. And if you watch the film again, 
you go, oh yeah, of course, he doesn't love me today. It's because it's not, you know what I mean? It's like, it's all in there. And it's just, I think it's a brilliant piece of writing. Uh, it's complex. And then the magic goes alongside. So you, you're tricked. The film is an illusion, you know, it's like, the trick is so simple and you're told it within the first 15 minutes. And I just love the fact that the sleight of hand of the film, uh, it was just so enjoyable. And then obviously, you know, to do all those trap doors practically and the doors opening for the new transported man. And then we, we had trap doors to throw doubles down below stage and the door would shut and then you pick your camera angles because the door would open against camera, like that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I, uh, even though it's on all my credits, I was a draft. My second ever film was on Bram Stoker's Dracula. Ooh, and yeah. So I was worked with second unit with Roman Coppola and we did all the, you know, the puppeteering and all the shadow stuff. Uh, and so, you know, I, I always associate Bram Stoker's Dracula second unit as my film education. Yeah. Uh, um, and so that really played a big part in the prestige because, you know, I spent months, um, you know, with, with projection and back projection and, you know, mirrors and ghosting, Pepper's ghost. So, I, you know, I had this sort of massive education on that film that was just, uh, which I loved. I love all these practical tricks, you know. Yeah. So, and so, yeah, The Prestige was, I think it, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think The Prestige or Dunkirk is, for me, we're like, <laughs> it's a close <laughs> one. <laughs> Well, it's, it's interesting. I, I love Bram Stoker's Dracula and I love how just tactile that film feels. Um, and you can feel that, that, that texture in, in Chris's films as well, um, that reliance on practical effects. But then obviously as you're moving into something like The Dark Knight of the Dark Knight Rises, the scale gets a bit bigger and there is going to be a visual effects component. Um, what was that experience like for you navigating the um, you know, what you could, the boundaries you could push with practical while also having to, you know, for something like the bat, the, uh, the flying um, vehicle, um, having to hand off to visual effects at some point. Well, although a lot of the bat is practical because we had it on a big truck arm. Yeah, I saw uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> I remember all the big set photos and videos from that time of the, just yeah. the client. <laughs> I think our rules are, uh, defining everything for visual effects. So if we get real photography for part of it, we know what it looks like. We know the lighting. We know what it has to do. We know the shadows it creates. You know, so um, you, there shouldn't be any guesswork. Uh, and so if we can get enough practically, if we can if we can start a sequence practically, go to visual effects, end it practically, then we we have the bookends that we work between. Um, and uh, and then it's just I mean you know Paul Franklin Dean uh, you know he works with Dean Egg, he's our visual effects supervisor for those films uh, is brilliant so he you know he you know, he's an art school guy and he he um, it's very important for him that you know the visuals uh, are seamless so uh, the hand although we 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 said in Batman Begins we'd never do anything flying. But <laughs> 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 because I remember the conversation after that because Begins, it's like, Chris, okay, we could do a bike. I'm like, that's only just okay for me, a bike, you know, a motorbike. <laughs> and then it was like, he, you know, he's very good at talking you into things. Yeah. So um, I always say, you know, if you're going to bore me to death, I agree. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, but um, we ended up with the bat. And then, so that was a, that, that was a journey to, just make it feel like something, uh, you know, and Chris comes in with a lot of ideas, which is because he, you know, often he spends a year in his office or who knows, he's got the secret case of scripts. So who knows when he, you know, and he, 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 um, he comes in with you know, having thought through all the bad possibilities. So I think it's a good way of analyzing it. Often on films, we have to sort of, we have to get through all the, you know, usually on film, you're in such a hurry as a designer, you maybe don't explore it enough and you need to get rid of, um, uh, you know, the stuff you won't like further down the road. And you, if you're in a hurry on a film, you end up with that and you're stuck with it. So we, have, we spend our time in the garage trying to get off the table all the stuff that isn't what we want. Um, yeah. And I think that's a, a key. It's like TARS, the you know, robots, like... Oh, 
you've know, got to design a robot. It's like, uh, uh, you know, it's like human employee <laughs> style. It's like everything's being done. So it's like, you know, uh, you know, it's that kind of thing. You have to get through robot design to get away from all the obvious, and I'll just say, geeky stuff. You need to like give it a character. Uh, yeah. Uh, and make it something like what, and at the same time, much like the Batmobile, you have to let the audience accept it. You know, we have to let Tars be accepted. Uh, it can't be just like, oh my God, what's that? Oh, because the minute you get thrown out of a film and you know full well, I haven't done my job right. You know, so if something jars, it's um, it's a problem. So, well, it, and speaking of Tars, Interstellar is just a massive film uh massively complicated uh i'm a big fan of that film and i, I was re-watching it recently and just kind of astounded at just how many different movies are in that one movie <laughs> how many different locations and sets and planets and characters that you're going through and then in the end you have to create this trans-dimensional space which you know you can barely even comprehend coming out of matthew mcconaughey's mouth let alone like you, the production designer, having to build that physically. Um, so what was that experience like jumping on Interstellar? Um, it was another one of those, don't hear from Chris for a while. It's like, oh, come over for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh God. And uh, it gives me the script. I sort of, there's only one script ever, one printed script. So I read it uh, in the garage and um, uh, it was just like, oh, Jesus, you know, it was like, <laughs> you know, there's the usual things as Chris, can you start tomorrow? <laughs> can you be in here tomorrow? Uh, and, um, you know, often with something, uh, you know, something uh, that complex, uh, we tend to like, we tend to leave um, some of the hard stuff to one side and just like let it, you know, brew in our heads. Cause it's like the Tesseract was, I remember when I read the Tesseract, it was like, Wow, that's uh, that's a very tricky, um, very tricky design job. And in, in this case, Chris really wanted to try and uh, deal with it uh, from like day one. So in the garage, so it was like, okay, let's go down. Like, and I've been I've been looking at nineteen seventies infinity boxes, which um, I think I'd sort of seen one in the Milwaukee Art Museum, probably when we were in Chicago at some point. Um, and you know there are infinity boxes, which you know, ultimate uh, expansion of the reflective space. So it looks like if you put lights in between a fifty percent mirror and a mirror, it just you know it looks like you're in a star field, which is all you know even though you're in the box the size of a phone booth. And so that to me was like okay, maybe this is a way in. So get in the car, go down the plastic shop. Chris is better known at this point, so I can't get him out of the plastic shop because the guy wants to talk to him. <laughs> and um, so we built this sort of nine stack infinity box and it was like, that's not going to work. I, you know, <laughs> it's like, I can't see anything. Um, and that design, uh, that was day one. And we didn't, it was the very last thing we solved. And we, I say Interstellar was the biggest uh, design job I think I've ever done. And I remember Paul Franklin coming in because it was like, dude, you need to get in on this Tesseract because, it's going to take a lot of us to try and figure it out because we couldn't quite get it. And then you know, Paul had a breakthrough of these, uh, you know, of uh, he saw this artist who'd done sort of timelines of, uh, we'd look at, we called them timelines, but it, it done this sort of flowing sculpture. It, they weren't timelines, but it was like, okay, what if time has a physical flow in terms of color strange? And so that was like, one building block and we so we went through we designed the rest of the film which was complicated enough and then we went through the production still not really uh figuring out the tesseract and we put it at the end of the shoot so we did myself paul and chris would meet because i'm also often in a different country trying to build a different set or trying to sort out you know a whole different thing so it'd be like let's all fly in to you know let's go into canada to the farmhouse and like let's spend like you know let, let's spend like an evening trying to where are we with the Tesseract? So we meet on, on these different places. And we finally were in Iceland. We got shut down because of some crazy storm that hit us. That, uh, you know, smashed all the windows. You, we were stuck in a, 
in this sort of hotel where you couldn't, you couldn't actually get out to your rooms because the wind was so strong. So we were all stuck in this sort of canteen, I think, or restaurant, maybe that, that's, anyway, it felt like a canteen. And we were like, we finally sat down because we, we were shut down from shooting for a day. And we finally figured out the Tesseract. But that's by far the hardest set I've ever done. And then, of course, I was left with this little time window to build it. Because uh, uh, you know we did all this uh, expanded flowing furniture in in X Y Z um, uh, between Merth rooms. Obviously, we cheat a little bit because we take out certain bits of furniture because they would block views and window going up. The windows you know moving would have to become light boxes. So we we finally came up with this language of sort of built this sort of three story set uh, Sony. Uh, that felt like it was one of the funnest sets I ever looked at because it felt like an art installation. It was like, <laughs> we felt like we built an art. It, like, it should be at the Tate Modern. You know? <laughs> so, and people coming in, I mean, the joy of it is we didn't really have to keep a secret because people coming in were like, I have no idea what this is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, Paul Franklin extended it. And, um, uh, you know, so it was definitely, it was actually one of the, you talked about the VFX crossover. That was one, the Tesseract I can, was a design by all three of us, and it took all three of us to figure that out. Uh, by far the hardest design. We had lots of stuff, like TARS, we had the Ranger, the Endurance, the Lander, we had these planets, you know, so, um, you know, the water, even the water. So, again, at the beginning, we went on our, our usual wandering. It was like, Chris looked at me and went, so we go, which way around the walls do we go? <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I like to start in Iceland because, uh, you know, it's always a great place to start. And we got an ice planet. We didn't know if we had to be in the southern hem hemisphere because we weren't sure when we were shooting. So it was like, well, let's just go around the wall that way. And so, uh, we, you know, we ended up in like weird places in the north of England, like Morecambe Bay, trying to find an endless expanse of water. Um, <laughs> you know, we could plant our spaceship in, you know, again, we, we have to do everything practically. So it's like, we're going to build our spaceship and we're going to put it in the sea, you know? So, yeah. Um, and so we, you know, we, we find ourselves waiting in odd places in the wall. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it, speaking a little bit to the, the visual effects component, uh, you worked on John Carter, which is a film that uh, I like quite a bit, mostly because of the world building that it feels like, an expansive world that I would like to spend more time in. I know that production was super challenging and I know that, uh, you know, Andrew had a bunch of hurdles going through. What was that, what was that experience like for you designing the world of that film? Well, when I read his script, I mean, his script was brilliant. I mean, it was like, it started in the, I think the 1860s. I mean, it was just, you know, it was time travel, you know, it was like, it was phenomenal. Um, and then the challenges of, you know, I, you know, I think the challenges of, I, you know, I'd almost forgotten, like on Batman Begins, we were relatively young in our careers and the challenges of not having total control are very, very difficult. Um, being told where you have to shoot and where the tax deals are, rather than managing it yourself as a group saying, we've got this much money, uh, you know, okay, so we want to go to Iceland. So how much of that pie can we spend going to Iceland? How, you know, you break up the pie, but we weren't in control of the pie. And, um, and I think, uh, that hurt us. Like we, we were, I, I always knew we should shoot in, I'd spent time in Utah. Um, and it was, you know, and when you look at, um, it's not the good, the bad, the ugly, it's one of the spaghetti Westerns, Pell Rider. And they go through that coal dust, uh, expansive gray nothingness that's in Utah. So I kind of knew them. I knew Mars was in Utah. Um, and I knew we had to film there and I knew we had to go where Clint Eastwood went for that film. <laughs> and um, I don't even know if it's Pearl Rider, I can't remember. Um, and, uh, and it was there, but then the other side of it, it was like, well, we should kind of build, do it all in America and use sound stages in the States nearby, but you know, the money said we had to go to London. So it made it uh, very difficult because we were in a rainy, wintry country shooting John Carter's Mars on the soundstage rather than outside. Uh, so we then suddenly went into this sort of green screen walled 
And if we'd been outside, I think it would have, with the sandstorms, I think it would have affected, um, it would have given it the reality that I like. Uh, I mean, I, I'm a sort of massive believer because of Chris, really, that when you're in the worst weather and you're in the most miserable time, the photography's the best. <laughs> <laughs> and when you can't see anything, somehow the camera does. Um, and I felt like we missed that. But I mean, that film, uh, that script, uh, it was brilliant. I mean, it was massively challenging. Yeah. Uh, and it really, um, it, was, it was a sort of struggle on all levels. Uh, uh, I, I, it's a shame for me that it wasn't better received, but uh, this is part of life, right? Yeah. I mean, I, to this day, I'm great friends with Andrew. Uh, we still we meet in a coffee shop in, in New York, uh, <laughs> and uh, we often talk about John Carter of what it should be, should have been. And there's these, there were two other scripts, you know, our outlines. Yeah. And uh, I think it could have been uh, much more. Um, anyway, yeah. This is filmmaking. I know I'm not alone in that. I, I really wanted to see what Andrew was going to do with those other two sequels. So. I think if he got, uh, it, yeah, I think, um, I, yeah, I think, I mean, they're still there. I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I think, I think he'd do a great job. Um, I mean, the stories get better. I mean, the stories are great. They're really good. And um, yeah, anyway, we'll see. <laughs> For sure. Uh, I did want to ask about Westworld uh, and you as a, you know, a film product production designer coming in to build a set that's going to last. I mean, that, that uh, Western town is just wonderful and, and you could watch everyone walking in and out, but then also designing the interior um, of Delos and, you know, those labs and that contrasting design. Um, how did you find that? Cause I, I understand you only just came in and like design the world for the pilot and then. Uh, yeah, it was, it was just one of those things. I remember, um, you know, sitting at home, the phone went, Jonathan, Jonah and Nolan called me uh, and said, hey, I got, a, I got this, I'm gonna do Westworld and uh, yeah, I need to like, tell me who I should hire as a designer. Like I gotta do, he had a guy he wanted to use for the series, but he said that, you know, HBO were really keen on the, and I think he was as well, like getting a big film designer to do, do the, the pilot. Um, I think those kind of theories have, have, have gone away now. Um, but uh, he called me and said, can you tell me who, because he, you know, he, he associates me with, obviously with his brother. So, but we, we're friends. And so he calls and says, who should I hire? I got to hire someone. So I put down the phone and, you know, I'm, the one thing uh, about me is like with my dad, we used to watch every film on the Sunday afternoon. You know, we were big David Lean fans and we used to watch Westworld. And I thought, I love Westworld, but it, it really annoyed me, that film, because it didn't, it wasn't good enough, you know? So, so I looked at my wife, Phyllis, who works with me, and we, um, I just said, well, maybe I should do it. So I rang him back and he was like, hey, I've got someone for you. <laughs> it's like, I'll do it. <laughs> I mean, I, the idea of the theme park and then Dallas is a designer's dream. You've got these two opposing walls that you can intercut between you know, you got the Western wall. And I, I always see the Western as like, I need like, you know, it's again, it comes from the spaghetti Westerns. Like you got the street and the mountain, you know, uh, or, or a John Ford film or, you know, you cut and the train comes in the end of the street, you know, mm -hmm. I, you know, once upon a time in the West, like you pull up, you get off the train, you walk up main street, you know, they these are the, for me, these are rules of, of Western. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it should be dusty and crazy and smoky and, you know, uh, and, um, so yeah, I was, we went up to, uh, the Melody Ranch, uh, and, um, uh, and we, you know, the town, usual Western back lot where it has a building at the end. So it was like, we got to knock down that building and put a train in the back. <laughs> so even though it was like just North of LA. So I borrowed a train off Fillmore trains cause they were, they needed somewhere to store trains. It's like, I've got the perfect place. <laughs> We're going to store it over here. So we knocked down the buildings. I think everyone was a little, you know, a little freaked out about it. And I was like, we have to make a Western town. And then Delos was, it's totally up my ass. You know, I, I love that kind of isolation. And for the first time, I got to use red. <laughs> <laughs> no red in Christopher Nolan movies. There's no red in Christopher Nolan movies. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's funny. Anyway, it was a great, it re, uh, Jonah and Lisa, uh, what a fantastic, um, uh, that was a fantastic job. So, yeah. uh, and then I handed over to his designer and, uh, you know, the rest is, he's been making that, what is it, three series now? Yeah, yeah, they're heading into the fourth uh, sometime. Yeah. And it did, you know, it worked that, that set, you know, some shows they rework the set later on, but like, nope, that's Westworld. That's what it looks like. Uh, so your design still stands. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, and, and then after, you know, Interstellar is this massive challenge, which all, with all of these sets and different worlds and everything. And then Dunkirk, I think, I haven't seen Tenet yet, but for me, I think Dunkirk might be Chris's best film. I think it's, just a really tremendous accomplishment, um, but also unlike anything else he's ever done before. Um, and you and you know you're working in these three separate uh, timelines. You got the air, the sea, and the land. Um, what was that? What was that one like for you? Uh, it's odd. It was like it, it wasn't so so much about uh, design. Design. I mean, it was about design, but it was it was about sort of like the practicalities of being a designer it was like you know interstellar was all design from day one dunkirk was um i mean dunkirk has an enormous amount of meaning for me as an englishman as well you know so it was like wow we have to it's one of those things i remember again it started chris rang me <laughs> and said hey meet me in <laughs> keep this quiet but meet me in dunkirk <laughs> i get on a plane <laughs> I'm here, you know, I meet me in Dunkirk. And so it was like, okay, I guess I can figure out what we're up to. <laughs> so, and so I meet him and he's in disguise in shorts and a baseball hat, you know, because, wow, who are you? Uh, and um, he was actually on vacation with his family. So I flew in and we spent a day we were trying to, he was trying to figure out whether we obviously we had to shoot something in Dunkirk was whether we had to really shoot the whole thing in Dunkirk uh, for, for many reasons. And, you know, the respect of, of, you know, the event, you know, so we, it's like, okay, let's go walking. So we walked the whole, it's enormous beach. We walked 18 kilometers. We walked the whole beach and uh, practically to the Belgian border. And uh, we sort of spent the day talking about it and then realizing it's like, we don't really have a choice. We have to film here. It's so unique. Uh, so design-wise, it was really about sort of really portraying every face of Dunkirk um, and making sure that we could sort of show the event um, without much digital work, without sort of actually show it and find boats, find planes, rebuild the pier, so the challenge, the physical challenge of that film, yeah, it was massively physical. Um, I think, you know, how many years on now, I'm not sure I'm physically up for that task. <laughs> you know, being at sea, you know, we, it's just uh, that mole, we rebuilt that mole out to sea and storms would hit us and uh, take some of it out. Um, it, weirdly, the tide always washed it to the same place. We always knew where the pier would be, but, um, you know, it was a huge engineering job. The city of Dunkirk were phenomenal. Like they, the Port Authority, you know, we sort of, and as we sort of went on that journey, I kept on going to this sort of what I used to call the industrial beach, which is just this flat concrete nothing. And the, where all the industry was that they bombed the hell out. That's what they were bombing. They bombed out all the industry. And even though it was modern industry behind us, it was sort of smoke and steam and, and so I felt like, I think the rawness of the film, I eventually got sort of like, oh, we need to get off and out of the three-story seaside bit and go to the, you know, we need to get out of that part of the film and get into the rawness of what the film needs to be, which was that, the desolation, you know, the desolate, like, foaming sea on that wash that's just so, you know, where they find the trawler, like, it's so inhospitable and... You know, that to me was the film. It was like, okay. And it took me a little while to realize it wasn't about this sort of, you know, 
lost army shooting their horses. I mean, all that did happen, but for us, the film was about this sort of, this sort of being, almost being stuck on a, uh, isolated island and you just can't get off every way you try you can't get off it's a nightmare you know so and and then the white mole uh which was the pier uh was the road to nowhere and it was just this white thing that went to sea so you know again the, these sort of clean images sort of became clear uh, we you know there's some fantastic things like uh we went over to ducksville to uh, ducksford to see if we could fly a Spitfire. So we went up in the, the two-seater Spitfires. It was like, um, which actually was truly one of the most magical moments of my life, getting to fly in a Spitfire. And then the pilot would let me take over. It's like, you know, you, <laughs> it was like, Jesus, I'm flying a Spitfire. <laughs> I mean, well, it wasn't a period Spitfire, but, and I think for me, sort of, for, for me, one of the most sort of iconic moments and sort of heartfelt moments was when we landed at Mark One Spitfire on Dunkirk Beach for real, and we touched down, and it was like it was a, it was a with it had Dunkirk colours which were very different on the underside of the Spitfire. There were these black and uh, white uh, colours underneath, and when that touched down, that was a sort of very magical moment. So uh, yeah, that that film was. You know, we strapped IMAX cameras onto wings. I mean, crazy. I mean, it wasn't crazy. It was engineered, but it was, like, difficult. There was nothing easy. And then our armada of ships was all, it was all real because we sort of came to the conclusion that we had one destroyer. We had a French destroyer that we added and adjusted to make it feel like an English destroyer because uh, there were no English destroyers apart from the Cavalier. It wasn't even there, but that was in dry dock. So the French... Again, the French authorities, Dunkirk City, sent their tugs around to Nantes, which is all the way around the coast, and pulled the museum ship into Dunkirk for us, which was just like, you know, it was just amazing. And then, so to get the scale of the other ships, it's slightly like different. We sort of came to the conclusion, it's like, okay, if we find ships are, uh, are half the scale, like 150 foot instead of 350 foot, we can put reduced size cannons and we can scenic the deck with scenery and they would look like full-size destroyers but they would be they'd be out to sea but half the distance they look twice as big so we sort of use all these sort of tricks that we've been using for years but on a massive scale so our whole armada was you know part of my job was going around europe looking for ships so you know i travel with neil the marine uh, coordinator and we'd end up in like riga looking at like russian gunships you know and like <laughs> it was like what are we <laughs> what are we doing and you know we finally found a hospital ship uh well it, it was a steamer up in uh in norway so that, that were willing to steam down to dunkirk so we eventually got all these ships to steam in and um uh, sorry uh, and then so that was um that was, uh, it, it was a, it's a great achievement, but it was very much a sort of physical, practical event. Uh, and obviously we had to, we built tons of Spitfires, I say obviously. So when Colin lands on the water, we're firing fake Spitfires out at sea and the upside down hull, uh, you know, is in this waterway in Holland, this endless waterway that's like got scaffold, 50 foot scaffold down to the seabed. You know, so there's the, the the uh, sort of engineering, you know, we'd end up, I end up a, a lot on like barges and boats, like trying to make sets in, <laughs> in crazy places. Um, but I'm very proud of that film. So yeah. I feel like, I feel like you're with that place, you know, so. Nolan has been a, a huge proponent of IMAX. Does, does the use of the IMAX cameras change your job at all? I, oddly, no. I mean, we first started using it, I guess, on Batman Begins for that opening sequence, the sort of prologue with, you know, the Joker and the masks. And that was difficult because, um, I mean, you see everything. Like, I see your shoelaces in immense detail, you know. So, but really, that just means you need to make sure everything is good in, in, in your field of view. So rather than looking at it like, through an Alfred Hitchcock box, you know, <laughs> you, you see the world. And so, 
Um, and that's why locations play more and more importance because you, you know, you can, you obviously have to build a uh, set. We try not to build sets because it's easier for everyone to be on stage. We try and build sets because we have to blow them up or do something very tricky uh, with them. So our sort of our language, our learned language is right. Can we find that or do we actually need to build it? So, but the, so the convenience of the sound stage doesn't, isn't on, isn't part of our language. It's really about, um, we have to do something odd with it. So I yeah. spin it around or whatever. Um, and I think that language has really helped us expand the film and IMAX has helped us expand the film through its lens on location. Um, I, I, that's, that's pretty, pretty important. Yeah. Um, I know you have to go, but I, I did want to ask about First Man, which I think is just a, a really tremendous piece of filmmaking. Uh, it feels like a time capsule. It feels like you're really looking back um, at a very specific moment in time. What was it like working with Damien on that film? Because it, uh, even the cinematography is very different on that film from some of Chris's stuff because it's very tight, um, you know, very handheld. Feels almost like you're watching home movies from, you know, the 60s. You know, Damien, uh, Damien, it was great. It, um, he was, uh, you know, we, we met, uh, we met in a piano bar at the, I don't know what I mean, we met in the Carlisle, on a La La Land <laughs> tour. And um, I, we got on again, we got on straight away. And, um, and uh, he really was so very keen you know, to do it practically because he felt like the visceral, the things you can touch were because of the event. It was, it was so raw and it was so, you know, it was, it was amazing they made it and you have to feel that danger. And so anything fake, the audience, I think it wouldn't have worked. So he was very keen on pro on, on process. And you know, that's my thing. Yeah. I love that stuff. Like I'm a production designer. I love the, the, I love the fact that we can mix all these mediums and different scales and, you know, cheat the audience in a way, but still practically it's old. I mean, honestly, it's old techniques, you know, new technology. So uh, and then, so that was a great group. And um, he was really searching to find that, uh, that raw, the rawness of the event and the immense danger these people were putting themselves into and, and, and put the audience there. Um, so, and we use miniatures as well. And, you know, I'm very much into 3D printing now. So we printed all the miniatures and we had this great LED screen, the Linus, uh, the DP, brought in and we could project, I mean, cause, cause of NASA, we've got tons of earth orbit stuff. So we just put a miniature in and find camera angles. We just had a lot of fun. Uh, even the Saturn five is a 14 foot miniature that we printed in the art department and we just stuck against the led screen. <laughs> but, I mean, it's really, it's really all goes back to methodology from Dracula. I have to say, we just, we just have great, we have much better back projection now. <laughs> so, uh, so we really, I love the fact design wise that these walls have now combined. Yeah. Uh, and I see it, I see people talking about like, oh, we can use this new technology and this old, you know, I see that happening and uh, it's fantastic, you know, so. Was it uh, easier or harder than you thought it would be to fake the moon landing? Uh, it, we were in Atlanta, so um, it was like going back a bit because it was like, you know, Again, the studio and the producers ran where we shot. It was like, you've got to go shoot in Atlanta. <laughs> so, <laughs> I never did Atlanta. so I was thinking, okay, I'm just going to ignore the moon because I'm just going to ignore it. And there were lots of suggestions in meetings. Like, oh, can't we just take the parking lot and put a big green screen around it? And it was like, <laughs> no. You know, and Linus was with me because he's like, the freaking, you know, the sun has to be like way up there. It's got to be huge light. So, uh, and... Um, so we just kept on ignoring it. And then I just happened to ask a location person. I said, I don't suppose you have a totally gray uh, quarry anywhere. Do you? <laughs> and they said, yeah, we do. It's called Vulcan quarry. And I said, cause you know, Georgia is just full of trees. You know, it's, yeah. full of scenery, it's full of trees. So we drive out to Vulcan quarry and it's just like this gray landscape. And um, it was like, oh my God, I should have asked you this question a few weeks ago. <laughs> and, um, so we met the owners and they, they, it was, you know, it was out to Southside Atlanta and they are like, 
people are so friendly and into film there. So that it's like any chance we could sculpt five acres of this and berm up to kill all the greenery in the background. And he was like, yeah, sure. And it was like, uh, I mean, obviously VFX then took over, but we gave them five acres of moon with craters. And then uh, uh, the landing spot, um, we sort of studied a map and we, we sort of recreated uh, as much as we could. And uh, so it was pretty shootable. Again, it comes down to this, you know, it's what we always do with Chris. It's like, you know, if you don't put up a green screen, if you don't, if you try and do anything practical, then in the edit, you can choose what you put visual effects on rather than having to put it on because you put a green screen up. So yeah. you, you, you get to decide that in the edit. And um, it was a great experience with Damien. It was, uh, uh, it was a good time. We, we still chat away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, it was good. I, I really enjoyed making that film. Again, oh, it wasn't, I think it was, might have been released at the wrong time. I don't know. Yeah. It didn't seem to hit the way it should have in my, my mind. So. No, I agree. I don't, I don't necessarily, it's still hard for me to figure out what happened with that because I was at the Toronto International Film Festival where it premiered and, you know, the critics really liked it and we all enjoyed it. And I don't know, for whatever reason, it just didn't connect. Yeah, it didn't connect. And uh, uh, that's, well, that's how it goes, isn't it? Yeah. If we could predict it, it'd be easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I know, I'm sure you were on the, under lock and key on what you can and cannot say about Tenet. Um, but I was curious if you could say, you know, how it stacks up challenge wise to the other films you've worked on with, with Chris. Um, well, this time we, we'd often like, we put ourselves in brackets, like, you know, Dark Knight Rises, is that a five country shoot? You know, like is uh, Interstellar a three country shoot? It's usually based on the budget. Um, and so we decided to sort of say, well, really this sort of journey, the journey of our protagonist has to, has to really cross the, the huge amount of borders. So we decided we were gonna try and get to seven countries and spend our money on uh, getting around these locations. Um, and so it was, it was different in that way. It was like, I mean, I, I, I felt like I was on a plane the whole time trying to figure out all these different countries and what we were doing. You know, we went from India, you know, across to Norway, then we're down to Italy, then England, and then I don't even know if I should be telling you all this, but we ended up in seven countries. And again, there's a big element in it, which is like, how are we going to do that? <laughs> you know, it's like, I remember like, can, uh, we might have to go to Mongolia. Can we send a scout to Mongolia? <laughs> and then uh, we didn't go to Mongolia. But uh, we just did one of those happy things. We sort of stumbled into this place, which is really the big set piece. The rest is all about location, 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 mm -hmm. and, and the journey. Um, but that's probably about as much as I can say. About <laughs> well, I, I mean, Chris has teased this idea of time inversion. And, and the big thing in the trailer is we see this kind of car chase that seems to be going backwards. How, how did you, uh, did the time inversion impact your job in terms of designing these places pretty significantly? Well, it's all practical. I'll just say that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so everything is practical. So yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was, uh, but it was complicated for all departments. Um, I say specifically for the stunt department. So, um, yeah, inversion forward and backwards is like things, uh, it changes your, the whole way a set has to work. So, so. <laughs> a fun challenge for you. Kind of like the, the Tesseract from Interstellar as an entire movie maybe. Yeah, uh, you, kind, yeah, kind of. The it's. The, I mean, when I first read Tenet, it was like, I think I had to read it five times. So, uh, <laughs> like, how does that work? <laughs> we always say every film we can't have done the film we've just made without having done all the others because they yeah. they all taught us something along the way. So, 
So we definitely are, uh, Chris is definitely in the business of um, making things more complicated, not less complicated. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to see it and then see it again so I can understand it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, Thank you so much for uh, giving us your time today. Um, as I said, I'm just such a huge fan of your design work and it's been great to kind of dig into, um, you know, how these movies were made and designed, you know, from your perspective. So. Perfect. We'll speak to you again soon, no doubt. <laughs>